Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults. We're holding this webinar in collaboration with the Diverse Elders Coalition. My name is Meredith Hanley. I serve as the Director of Community Capacity Building at US Aging, and I oversee the Engaged Resource Center. Our webinar today is called Social Engagement Among Tribal Elders, Creative Activities and Approaches. During the webinar, we'll hear from the Administration for Community Living. We'll discuss topics like how Title VI Native American Aging Programs address social engagement and social isolation of tribal elders, best practice strategies, and potential partnership opportunities. Attendees will also hear from the Seneca Nation Area Office for the Aging and Shoshone Bannock Tribes on how both Title VI programs are helping elders stay connected and engaged. Next slide. We, we have a few housekeeping items. All attendees on the webinar are in listen-only mode for the webinar, so that, that does mean your microphone or phone will be muted, but there are still ways you can engage with, with our speakers today. So you can submit questions for the presenters at any time during the presentation. Just click on the Zoom Q&A question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and then type in your question and hit the submit button and we'll save time at the end of the webinar to go over as, as many questions as we can. There's also the chat feature, and I, I see a few folks engaging in that already, which is great. So you can click on the chat button. You can submit a message to us, the host, if you need technical support, but you can also use the chat to engage with each other, introduce yourselves, and, and the like. We are recording this webinar, um, and, and we'll share a link with you in, in the next few days if you want to re-listen to any sections or perhaps perhaps share a link with a colleague. Next slide. For anyone who's using a screen reader or perhaps wants to silence unwanted chatter in the chat and Q&A boxes, you can activate the speech on demand feature by pressing insert spacebar and then pressing the letter S on the keyboard. Also, um, you can view closed caption subtitles, watch a live transcript of the meeting, or adjust the size of subtitle text. And to control that, um, click on the CC or live transcript button in the control bar at the bottom of the Zoom window. And again, if you'd like to notify us that you need technical assistance, you can chat us directly in the chat, send a, send a chat to the host, or you can raise your virtual hand in Zoom. Um, and you can, in addition to using the toolbar at the bottom of the screen to raise your hand, you can also raise and lower your hand by pressing Alt plus Y on your keyboard. So that, that's a little tip if that's helpful. Next slide. So just we'll share a little bit of information about my, my organization, uh, US Aging. US Aging is the national association um, representing and supporting the network of area agencies on aging. And we also advocate on behalf of the Title VI Native American Aging Program. We have a number of initiatives that can be found on our website, which is usaging.org, um, if you'd like to, to read up more on any of these initiatives. But we administer in initiatives like the Aging and Disability Business Institute. We co-lead um, the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center with Easter Seals. We lead the, the Dementia Friendly America Initiative. We also operate the Elder Care Locator and the Disability Information and Access Line Dial, and have many, many, many more efforts <laughs> as well, in fact. Um, so again, more information can be found on our website. Next slide. So the webinar today um, is convened by Engage in collaboration with Diverse Elders Coalition, but I'll talk a little bit about Engaged on this slide. Um, Engaged is the short name for the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults. Um, U.S. Aging, the organization I was just describing, and Ministers Engaged. Engaged is a, is a national effort funded by the Administration for Community, community Living through a, a cooperative agreement, and we work to increase the social engagement of older adults, people with disabilities, and, and their caregivers. Much of our work focuses on identifying and disseminating information about emerging trends and developing resources, tools, compiling and compiling best practices, compiling and sharing best practices. We're guided by a project advisory committee with representatives from 18 organizations and resource centers who help to guide and shape our work um, and, and lend insights from their fields of expertise. And, um, and we have a website as well, engagingolderadults.org. Next slide. 
Next slide, and perhaps the most exciting slide, is I'd like to introduce our, our speakers for, for today's discussion. We're joined by Cynthia LeCount, Director, Office for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiian Programs with the Administration on Aging, Administration for Community Living. We're also joined by Bethany Lay, Acting Director, Seneca Nation Area Office for the Aging, Joyce Hayes, Title VI Director, Shoshone Bannock Tribes, and Myra Fred, Caregiver Coordinator, Shoshone Bannock Tribes. So with that, Cynthia, I will turn it over to you for your remarks. Hello, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? You can see me now. Hello. Yes, everyone. we can, thank you. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. I, it was great to see where everyone is from as you were logging on. Hello to Montana. I'm Montana born and born and raised. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, there's also someone from the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Association. We are all, all about Wisconsin worshipers in Title VI because there's so many good things going on out there and you work so closely with the tribes. We're really grateful for those efforts. So hi, everybody. I am a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa from North Dakota. I grew up in Montana. I am uh, the daughter of Willard LeCount and Venice LeCount. My, my grandparents um, were Tressa Portra LeCount and Ernest LeCount. I grew up not knowing my mother's family well because she married um, an Indian. So um, my father was a World War II veteran. I'm very, very proud of, the, the, of my dad and the, the service he had and the work that he did in raising us all so well, or I think well, raising us on a family farm. Uh, talking about Title VI a wee little bit, Title VI is just one of the best parts of the Older Americans Act, I think, and certainly I have the best job in the federal government, so I, uh, we're, I'm very, very lucky in, in what I get to do, and I have learned so much from, uh, hey, Alzheimer's Association, you guys are part of our conference, our national Title VI conference in April, by the way. Shelby, somebody, I don't remember her last name, but yeah, Alzheimer's Association is there. Um, but Title VI was what became a part of the Older Americans Act in 1978. Remember, the Older Americans Act was first passed in 1965. So it, after about the first 13 dozen years, 12 years, 13 years, tribes were realizing that services weren't quite reaching rural and often isolated um, in parts of Indian country or Alaska villages. And so the National Tribal Chairman's Association, which was active back in the 70s, uh, brought together elders to Phoenix and they convened a meeting about elder services. They were, they contacted the older, or the, excuse me, administration on aging and began conversations and um, to develop a specific title to serve American Indians, Alaskan and Alaska Natives. And um, there was some folks, Larry Curley was, was the headliner back then. Uh, Larry worked at the National Indian Council on Aging, which was just being formed in the same time in the same meeting. And they sent Larry, who's Navajo, out to Washington, D.C. to have boots on the ground. And he walked the halls of Congress and the Administration on Aging. And we were successful in adding Title VI to the Older Americans Act in, in 1978 amendments and the first funded programs. We had 80 programs. Everything was in the eights, I think. I think we funded 80 programs at $80,000 in 1980. <laughs> um, 
And those programs have all definitely continued since that time. Joyce, I, you might have been one of those. And Beth, you may have been too, because they tried to scatter them around the, around the country. Hawaii was added in 1976 amendments, I believe, when some of us were lobbying and went to Senator Inouye and asked him for support of Title VI, a Title VI in funding increase. And Senator Inouye said, absolutely, we will do that. And, and we were calling ourselves Native Americans at that time. And Senator Inouye said, you know, you're Native Americans. We have Native Americans in Hawaii. And I would like to include them in these funds. So if you agree to write Hawaii into this title, into these services, I agree to increase your, your um, to sponsor a bill to increase funds. So voila. Hawaii became a part of the Title VI programs at that time. So that's a quick rundown of the history, but the best part of all, everything I just said was that it was elder driven. It was tribally driven. And what they wanted developed was a program that would allow tribes to provide culturally appropriate services to very cultural tribal elders many of whom think now we're back in the 1970s when we weren't all connected by cell phones and computers. So isolation was, was bigger then, I think, than it definitely is now. So moving a little bit into what um, Meredith had asked me to talk about here, you know, gee, that COVID, that came fast and it came hard and it had tremendous impact in Indian country. I'm sure many of you have read about it or some of you are close enough to working with tribes that you saw it for yourselves, but it was devastating in Indian country. We lost a lot of, we um, as a community lost a lot of, of people. We lost a lot of elders. I know there was one tribe who lost their last fluid, fluent language speaker. Think about that. Think about that. The Crow tribe in Montana believes that when they lose their language, they lose themselves as people. And we're watching that happen with this, this devastating pandemic. Um, there was a story that happened on Navajo Nation early, early, early in the pandemic. And again, because we don't have broadband, we don't have good sources of communication sometimes. There was a mother and a son, very isolated up in the hills on the Navajo Nation, who died early on in COVID. They didn't know there was COVID. They didn't know anything about it because they didn't have any means of communication. They had a, uh, there was a sister who would come up every week or two weeks and provide food and, and check on them. And this happened during, in between her visits. So it came faster than, than, we could, than we could hang on to it. I heard Navajo Nation talk about a story too, and I want you to think about this in, in working with tribes. Navajo Nation talked about what a huge, huge issue this was because there was no word for it in their, in their language. What's COVID? There was no word. If you give in, in with some Indian tribes, if you give things a name, you don't want to name something because when you name something, you're giving it life. And they didn't wanna, they didn't wanna give COVID a name because they didn't want it to continue and, and to be more, more COVID. They ended up calling it some, something like the big cough in the work that they did. So COVID hit us hard and it had devastating impacts. Our elders were very, very isolated. We worked hard to keep our seniors isolated. Tribes closed borders, um, tribes closed buildings, tribes closed operations down, senior centers did not operate, meals were closed, they uh, food, uh, hauled food boxes, they um, 
sometimes could cook a meal and, and do a curb stop pickup seniors literally drive up in your pickups staff is out there dressed in gear protection gear handing out meals to seniors <clears throat> tribes were amazing in how they hard they worked to meet the needs or to to still keep in some kind of contact with the seniors for a group of people who depend on one another in our communities we are, we're intergenerational. We live in intergenerational households. It's very common to have three or four generations living in the same home. We, family isn't just what's within our four walls. Family is a whole lot of people, a whole lot of relatives way down the line, you know. Some, some folks talk about, sorry, some folks talk about second and third and fourth cousins. We don't. They're still brothers and sisters and they're still aunties and uncles. So all of a sudden we weren't able to do that. We were telling our elders, nope, nope, you got to stay home. We'll bring you what you need. Nope, you can't. And we don't have telephones. We don't have computers. Isolation was really hard on our families and on our seniors. That was, that was tough stuff because our families were so woven. <laughs> that last call was my granddaughter, as a matter of fact. We're still so woven with our families that we need that daily, that daily contact. And then think about the lessons that that contact gives. Not only are we giving hugs and kisses and, and helping cook or feeding people, we're speaking our language and we're sitting there working on our crafts. So it's a visual impact. It's a his, history. It's a cultural visit. It's all part of the one. Um, how does Title VI get to address social isolation? Oh my goodness. Wait till you hear the stories coming after me. Beth and Joyce and Myra and other Title VI programs have done the most astounding work. Um, create creative, total creativity, but making sure that we reach the seniors in some capacity. And remember in our communities, the seniors aren't just that old lady that lives down the road. She's probably my auntie or she's my, my grandma's somebody, or, you know, there's a, there's a role there and we're, we don't work with clients. We work with families and we work with people and we know our communities. We know their living situations. We know who needs what. We know who to watch for, who to watch out for. We have good communications and, and we're small. The small size of most of our communities is a really good thing because we can kind of keep an eye on people. But sometimes the small size of our communities is, is a really bad thing, too, when you're looking at service delivery and um, maybe knowing too much about families. The last thing I know I've rambled on here, the last thing I wanted to talk about was some examples of how outside agencies have worked have done some really cool work with social isol isolation. That's a hard word to say, especially when you lisp. But an example that we've just loved that happened again pretty early in the pandemic was those folks. I don't know if anybody from Oklahoma is on the call or if, even better if anyone from the Grand Gateway, I think it's Grand Gateway AAA is on the call. That's in Northeastern Oklahoma. And we've got five Title VI programs up there that are relatively small and, and close together. So they coordinate a lot of activities. This AAA came in and, and worked with, worked with um, the, the tribes and they started parking lot bingo. They made sure that all the cards were sanitized and sealed in a Ziploc bag Everybody is dressed in your protection equipment. The staff managed to get some 
golf carts from the local casinos so they could ride around and take, give people their cards and take prizes and interact a little bit. But the, the, the bingo happened in the parking lots and there's lots of horns and hollering and great celebration because people got to get together. They all had to park six feet apart. They all had to keep their windows closed. They all had to be masked, but they were together in a group. And that wasn't just a Title VI initiative, that was with the, the AAA. Certainly that, was, that could happen and was successful because the Grand Gateway AAA has made certain to, to, I know I love that idea too, the Grand Gateway um, AAA has made sure to become familiar, to familiarize themselves with the elders and the programs in these reservations, and to make sure that the seniors know who they are too. So when they come in, they're part of the group. They're just there. They're, they're known. Hi, hi, Beth. Hi, Amy. How are you doing? Oh, it's so good to see you again. It's not that they're popping in the door totally out of the blue saying, hello, I'm from, hello, I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help you. Um, sometimes in Indian country, we, we, um, we're slow to, to trust. We're slow to accept new folks. We're slow to accept new um, coordination, but we're really eager to build some relationships. And so a, a word of advice, I think, is to let's, let's all work really hard on building these relationships. We certainly saw during this disaster situation the importance of working together. I said I'm from a, uh, Montana. I'm from the northeast corner of Montana that's almost Canada and it's almost North Dakota. It's not a reservation. I'm on trust land, my tribe, Turtle Mountain, long history with our treaties, but we're, we're off reservation people. We're in between Fort Peck Sioux tribe on the right or on the west, and they were our mortal enemies. And then we've got the Mandana, Ricker, and Hadatsa on the east side. We weren't too cool on them either. So they sort of put us in the middle of the enemy territory. My family, the people in my community live just about the same. Well, they do. They live the exact same life that everybody else in the community. There's not a difference in who's Indian and who's not Indian. There's not a difference in the service delivery. We all receive county-based meals. We're all working together. I have grown up seeing that the conditions and the needs of very rural America, um, the you know rural cowboy farmer country, our needs and you, the needs of tribes are so similar. Transportation is huge issue, lack of services, roads, on and on and on, they're the same issues. So let's keep that in mind as we're planning our services. You know, yeah, we're Indians and yeah, we're cultural and yeah, we, we do things our way, but at the same time, there's a whole lot of ways we're not that different than you are. And one of the things I've really advocated for is that my little hometown needs help with, with um, caregiver assistance. They need help with menu development. So do the tribes. So let's all coordinate and find a way to serve all everybody because we're serving everybody in communities. Let's mirror our communities in the makeup of our communities in the services we provide. Get to know us. If you see there's a sign up to go to a powwow, Get your sunglasses and get your, your jacket for nighttime and grab a chair. You got to take a chair and go out and watch the powwow and, and talk to people and eat some really good food. If there's an event that is publicized, go to it. People are always saying, can I go to that? I'm not a tribal member. Can I go? If it's publicized, go to it. If we don't want you to know about an event, you ain't going to know about it. And those are the ones you don't, you shouldn't go to. 
So I'm going to shut up because I want you to hear what Seneca Nation and Shoshone Bannock are doing. So off camera, I go. Thank you for listening to me. I don't truly know if you listen to me or not. Maybe everybody turned me off. But thank you very much. And Beth Lay, it is you. Thanks, everyone. I cannot start the video. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, Beth, and, and that is fine if your video is not working. No, no worries on that. Okay. Um, I guess, well, you can't really. So, okay. Um, my name is uh, Bethany Lay, and um, our greetings in Seneca Nation is Nyawaiskano, and it means I'm thankful you are well. So I just want to send that out, out to you all. Um, I am the acting director of the Seneca Nation Area Office for the Aging. Um, I have worked with, within this department for over 20 years. Um, I started out as the budget assistant. Um, I became the budget supervisor and then deputy director. And right at the start of COVID, I was made the acting director. So it's been four years in March that I have been the acting director. Um, so I met Cynthia at a Title VI conference and Cynthia came to Seneca Nation and she did an evaluation for our congregate, our, our nutrition sites. So she got to see where we are from. Um, she got to ride with our drivers, um, our home delivered drivers and our home delivered drivers were elders. So it was, she put, when she evaluated us, she put into words how she enjoyed that our elders are serving other elders. So, and it was, it was heartwarming to hear that because we never thought of that. My video will not start. Um, okay, um, next slide. So this is where we're from. Um, New York State, when, um, we're located in uh, Western New York. Uh, the Seneca Nation has two elder centers and three congregate locations. Um, two sites are located in the city of Salamanca and one in Irving, New York. Um, as you can see, we're very close to the city of Buffalo. So we're about 30 minutes from the Irving location and more like 60 minutes from um, for our Salamanca territory, our, our Allegheny territory, I should say. So with that, um, the Seneca Nation has over 900 el enrolled elders and our age um, for elders is 60 years of age. So that is our service area. Um, all of these elders do not live in our service areas or may not want to use our services at this time. Um, to date, the Seneca Nation services around 465 elders and approximately 3,700 units of service a month. Um, as you can see on our, our map as well, we have Aboriginal territories in the Buffalo and the city of Niagara Falls. Um, the Seneca Nation is part of the Haudenosaunee Conference Confederacy, which are compiled of six nations. They are the Kyuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, Tuscora, and they're located, their territories are located throughout New York State. Um, next slide. I just went over all that. Next, <laughs> next slide. Okay, so like Cynthia said, you know, um, as with our, you know, all agencies or offices for aging, um, COVID hit us hard. Um, we were definitely challenged with isolation. Um, many of us were, you know, couldn't see our families. We couldn't travel. Um, it was just taking a toll on everyone, losing, losing our family members to COVID. It was just, it was 
not a, a good time for us, right? So our nation, it was our duty, it was our AOA duty to outreach to as many elders as we could. Um, we were shut down. Um, we had over 30 employees working here at AOA between the three sites and only five of us stayed working. So in that time, um, we had to collaborate with other departments that were still working within the Seneca Nation and we were managed to stay open. Um, our, new, like, our nutrition program doubled or tripled in home delivered meals. Um, we had to deliver safely. Um, there was a no contact delivery service. Um, we just, um, we used um, to go containers so nothing was returned to us. Um, we, the elder had to leave out a cooler to keep their food safe, um, either whether it was cold to keep it hot or if it was hot to keep it cold. So um, it, was a, it was a hard time. It was, um, we had three employees come from our language department who helped deliver, who helped cook, who helped prep, who helped clean, who helped drive, um, it, was, it was amazing, you know? So it was a, it, this was hard to do with five people. Um, at this time, we are now fully open. Um, we still do the grab and go meals. We still have elders afraid of COVID. So um, the grab and go meals are an alternative for them. Um, our AOAs, even our agency, is still kind of closed. They work from home. So it's difficult for us to, our funder, our New York State Office for the Aging, you know, some days they're in, some days they're not in, they're working from home. Um, so we had to wait. We have to wait for our questions. We have to wait, you know, for an answer um, until they came in. So COVID's still here, so, you know, even though it's more manageable, more manageable but it's still here. Um, so I can, you know, the Seneca Nation, the tribal council fully supported our office for the aging and anything we tried to do. Um, so this outreach was important to us. Um, next slide. So to promote our, our AOA services, when we had hardly anyone open or here, um, we had a new position, an outreach coordinator. This was created to implement our outreach plan for the Seneca elders. Um, she was to develop and execute a marketing plan for the Seneca Nation AOA program to, to provide information to our community elders about our resources, facilities, locations of services. Um, she went to all the community events, the festivals, the fairs, um, health fairs, anything. She would sit outside our health department when, you know, catch them when they came outside from, you know, doctor appointments. And um, her, her degree is in marketing, but she, she has um, elder grandparents yet. And so she was more than, she jumped right in. She was a go-getter. And I think that helps. I think that helps when you, when you need to outreach, you need somebody who is able to have that rapport and, and she was just perfect. She's perfect for the position. Um, so a lot of these slides, a lot of these pictures that you will see upcoming are you know, mainly of, of her events. So without her, you know, she, was, she was doing a great job. She still is doing a great job. So um, next slide. This is one of her letters. She sends out to one of our, to our new elders that turned 60. Um, she welcomes them to, the, to be in a Seneca elder and lets them know what kind of services are available at AOA. Um, she sends them, also sends them a newsletter. We have, this was one of her first jobs to do when she got here. I told her I needed a newsletter. I needed a newsletter to get out to all the elders because you know they're still afraid. You know, they're still afraid to congregate. They're still, you know, didn't want around, want to be around people. So um, this was a great way to, you know, see what's going on, what we're doing, 
um, upcoming events, um, just about everything. Um, we have a lot of events, you know, community events. Um, a couple of them that I want to mention is remember the removal. Um, how we got on our territories is the Kanzua Dam and took away a lot of the Seneca Nation elders' territory in the Allegheny Territory. Um, and the Army Corps of Engineers um, built a dam on their Aboriginal lands and they lost their homes. They lost, you know, their cemeteries where their family were left and um, a dam was built. And so the reservoir covered their land. Um, so each year we have, a re we have a remembrance and also we have residential school healing, um, which where my congregate site in Irving, New York, where my office is, sits on a residential school um, land. So it's a, it's a kind of a, it's, it's good for people and so it's bad, for, it's kind of sad for people. So they don't like to remember, but you know, they still continue to, you know, to um, get together and they do a healing walk. So everyone wears orange, you know, you know, you don't um, forget or whatever. Um, every child matters. Um, is their um, logo or whatever. I'm sorry, I've lost chain, my chain of thought. Um, so we also have a senior advocate. Um, she also partakes in all of this. Um, she advocates for services for the elder. She will, she's the liaison from the elder to the services. If um, they get services, they're not like elder, there's elder abuse, there's um, trouble with the, the um, family members, um, things like that. She's, she, she steps in and she reaches out and guides them to proper, um, departments that will help her, um, help them, you know, and getting them the, the, to the right department to get their services that they, they might need, you know, um, housing issues. Um, I'm just trying to name a few. Um, just a couple of things like that. Um, let me see here. So as, as um, Cynthia, mentioned um a lot of elders aren't on social media we do have a facebook page and um we do a lot of our advertising you know trying to do our promoting but we don't have a lot of elders who are tech savvy who are know about fiber optic or um, wi-fi or anything like that so it was very hard for us to to try to get them to do this and we we're still kind of rural so we didn't have, you know, Wi-Fi. We didn't have cable. Um, this, the Seneca Nation just put that up this year. So now we do have some fiber optic going through the territories now. So it's getting easier for them. But they still, you know, they don't know how to use their smartphones. They don't know how to use, you know, their um, smart TV, things like that. So um, social media was hard for them. So we just, we, we do a lot of mailings. We do, we do send everything out, we do our surveys, we do uh, you know anything, events we have coming up, we send it out in the US mail. What I'm trying to get going is a possible TV station for us um, because a lot of elders like to watch TV. At their appointment or their dental appointment or anything, you know, their diabetes check or their, you know, put that there and watch a, a maybe an intro on, you know, on what our services are, what's going on over here, our wellness, you know, we have um, um, exercise bingo over here. We have um, um, the balance classes, I should say, too, we have, um, so things like that. So. Now that the Wi-Fi and the fiber optics and the internet is here, you know, I've been trying to get our media department to possibly do that for us and try to up, 
try to upgrade our um, website as well. Um, that's coming in slowly, but um, we're getting there. Um, so these are a couple of things that we do. A pool table. They love the new pool table. Um, we have Allegheny versus Cataraugus elders having pool tournaments. You know, they come in first thing at nine o'clock in the morning and they're playing pool. <laughs> so monthly we'll get together and, and have a pool. Um, we also do um, card games. Um, they'll play um, um, cards for a dime, you know, for dimes or whatever. Um, they've gotten to a weekly bingo going for Thursdays and they'll throw in quarters, play, they'll buy a card for 25 cents. Um, our, um, Coordinator, you know, does some, you know, digging to find people to help donate, you know, things like that for us. And um, they'll go to the Bills game inside, be able to sit in, indoors out of the weather. Um, they also will do that for the um, lacrosse is big up here. So we have, um, you know, the Buffalo Bandits, we have the Buffalo Sabres, you know, um, for hockey team. So we are able to, you know, get things like that donated to us. So we're able to take our elders. What also helps is having our own bus. We have a 20 passenger bus. We have CD, a CDL driver on each territory who are able to, it's a wheelchair accessible bus. Um, so we are able to do our own transportation to take them to their events, um, take them to local shopping, um, big shopping trips, long, long uh, days, day trip to a casino, um, or also they like to go to theater shows. Uh, I think they have went to the Trans-Siberian Orchestra last month. Um, they like to get dressed up and see the shows. They go to, the, uh, um, they saw Hamilton, the same, a few of the shows. Um, it's, it's, it helps, you know, to be able to do these things for them. And right now they're small. Well, they're just small trips, but it's they're getting there. They're getting back to being able to trust being out there in the world again. So, um, <laughs> I think that helps us a lot is the food, um, giving food giveaways, um, drive through food giveaways, blizzard boxes. Do that. So, um, there's there's so much good here, but. <laughs> And I, I hate to um, hate up hate to put a pin in it for now, but I I do want to save time for our our next two speakers too. Okay. I'm so gonna, um, maybe with um, anything you didn't have a chance to get to, maybe you can put a little note in the um in the chat, and then if we have time in the Q and A, we can um, cover it then as well. But thank you. That was that was really really great, and appreciated those neat visuals. Um, well, nice. Nice. Well, let's go ahead and bring in. Oh, sorry, Beth. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm done. <laughs> I was. Mm -hmm, I was just going to say um, thank you, and I think let's go ahead and bring in Joyce and Myra, just because I want to make sure they they get their their time allotment too. So, Joyce and Myra, would you go ahead and come off mute and come on camera for us and and share what what um, you you had prepared for remarks? Thank you. And we see you and we do hear you. So I think you're okay. set to go. Thank you. Um, I'm Joyce Hayes. I work here with the Shoshone Bennett tribe in Fort Hall, Idaho. That's the eastern part of Idaho. And what else? What else? <laughs> I work for. Um, I've worked for the elderly nutrition program since 1983, starting in the kitchen area. Worked my way up to director, been director for the program since 1997, and serving our elderly community here with meals, home delivered meals, congregate meals, um, curbside meals now, and 
we pretty much um, worked throughout the COVID time as well with um, with delivering the meals within um, um, putting them in coolers and um, making sure that our elders get something to eat every day. And we also started the curbside meals as well. And, and our clientele has, has doubled too. So serving a lot more people than what we were doing before COVID. And keeping the elders at home to be safe. Um, we have Myra here and she does check on the elders at home with the caregiver program. And our activities, we have quite a few activities here as well. We have daily bingo for the elders. Uh, recently, I just started uh, Bannock and Shoshone language from 12 o'clock to 12.30 during the week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Exercises. We've started um, Tai Chi uh, strength exercises. Um, in the past, we've had uh, storytelling. Oh, right now we have storytelling from the uh, tribal librarians who come in and they read a story to the elders from 11.30 to 12 o'clock with winter stories and uh, you have to apologize for the background noise because we're in one open area and we're having lunch right now and the TV is going so if that's what you might be on I don't know it's real loud over there <laughs> and Meyer if you could lead a little closer to the camera uh, that that would help us here thank you yes I'm Myra Fred and I'm the Oh, caregiver coordinator, and I'm apologizing for our background noise because we are in an open area. Um, I started in 2018. Um, under we underwent major disasters here. Our kitchen drift fell in, so now they put us in the old casino, so it's totally open. Um, next to me is the dining room. It's really loud. We're having lunch right now. The TV is going, so you have to bear with us on that. But uh, we have a lot of activities going. Um, COVID really hit us hard, um, but we had to get creative, and we had a lot of activities outside on the curbside and the home delivery. Um, but one of the ones that I really was really proud of is we did um, – homemade mask COVID mask and the elders got very creative we don't have a slide but I am going to put it up a picture of what we did I don't know if anybody can see that no <laughs> oh, well anyways it was so nice they needed them everything it was it was good um we're doing a lot of respite care that's what I'm kind of specialize in um out there with the people um we just recently hired a um, nurse, right? a yeah. community health worker. And so we're all getting back into the groove of, um, we opened up the dining room. Um, got a lot of activities planned. Um, most though, if we really want to get into the culture, the language, um, and also just the fitness, mental and health fitness. So with that, um, I'll give it back to Joyce. <laughs> Yeah, like she said, we have a lot of activities planned for the elders. In the past, we've taken them to different activities, like um, we go on trips for vacation, like to, we went to South Dakota, we've gone to California, we've gone to Nevada, we've gone to Washington, and those are pretty nice trips that the elders get to go on. Um, it's all for um, bringing elders together to socialize and having a good time. They enjoy 
being together over the holiday weekend when after it was finished and we returned back to work they were all like oh we missed you we missed each other <laughs> so they really uh, enjoy the congregate meals now that we started it back up again um we also sponsor our MEPA. We do a MEPA presentation and people all come and join in on that presentation. We give out zip goodies to the elders. They really like the jackets and they, they wear them around. You can see them throughout the community when you go places, do things, you'll see the elders wearing their jackets. So that's pretty nice for them. Um, we're going to be having a diabetes and nutrition presentation February 27th for our congregate meals here. So that we're looking forward to that. And that's presented by our dietitian, um, diabetes educator, Aaron Brown, Brownlee and Kevin Pendaberry. Um, what else do we do? We do we do so many things. Um, we have an elders um, honor elder day during the year, and um, in the past we've sponsored um, elders powwow along with that. And we take our elders out to the Eastern Idaho State Fair. They enjoy that going to um, watch the Indian relay races. That's really fun. And we also have a sponsor, Elders Got Talent contest, and the elders come in and sign up, and they get to show their talent. Some play drums, some sing, some play other instruments. It, it's pretty nice. Some tell a story or a poem. Um, we have um, a dress contest during our elder day event our indian day event and then and, and they dress up in in their indian regalia and come in and 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 um, we have a small presentation from our language and culture department on that on that day so that's pretty nice Oh geez, we've had so many stuff that, and sometimes our, our casino, our Shoshone Bannock Casino come over and they do give the elders uh, gifts as well. Um, during COVID, we were the, pretty much the main people that were giving out information to our elders. So through, through the um, home delivery, we handed out a lot of things to our elders, flyers, information, show band news, paper, um, meat boxes, food boxes, and we gave out uh, masks. Um, COVID the prevention information and uh, just a lot of things that we did and also our queens would stop by and they would also um, give out gifts to the elders and yeah that's why our curbside deals went so high because we had a lot of participation from our elders that came over for for those We also do um, day trips that include things like um, going to the um, museums nearby. And we also we have visited um, Yellowstone National Park. We take our elders choke cherry picking. Um, we do like take them to lava hot springs and just numerous activities like that for them 
Is there anything else you would like to add? Um, yeah, I'll add that we do have, um, we work real close with our ALA area on aging and our Title III programs, and they come out and do presentations and classes with us, um, living with chronic conditions and powerful tools for the caregivers. We also have the county extension program come out and they help us with our doing presentations and classes on healthy eating. Um, we work really close with our own IHS and tribal health. They come and do a lot of presentations on health, healthy eating, healthy living. And also um, we work with um, Marcia Hall on her uh, adult protection services. They come over a lot and help the elders out um, and help us out too in our program when we're doing the um, curbside meat boxes and food baskets. Marcia's program always came over and helped us. That was a lot of work, but they jumped in and helped us. Um, other things that we do, we work closely with the Shoshone Bannock Language and Culture Program and try to go to all the activities they have. And, and it's good. It's um, helped us to retain and remember all of our the tribal uh, history. And uh, let's see what else. Uh, Idaho Food Bank, they have monthly food box distributions out there. Um, our 477 program, they do a lot of uh, distribution. And so we all work, work together. <laughs> Everybody works together out here to ensure our elders' needs, their caregivers' needs are met. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That was so cool. It was so neat hearing um, all the different activities that you guys have been working on. And I mean, I just can only imagine the amount of work that goes into each and every one of those too. But the, the elders got talent, um, found it really cool. And then all the trips you were mentioning, but we are running short on time. We're, we're due to close here at, at two Eastern. So I, I do want to just keep an eye on that. Um, We'll, I'll, I'll highlight a couple slides here, but I won't go into depth at them in, in, with them at all. Um, you can go to the next slide, which is just highlighting a few resources from Engaged. I mentioned our Engaged Resource Center earlier, and there's the URL here in the slide deck. Um, and again, you'll have everyone here on the call or who registered will have access to a recording of this webinar and um, access to the PowerPoint as well in case you want to click on any of the links that were provided or, or grab speaker contact info. I think it also got cross-posted in, in the chat sometimes. But next slide. Um, we're also at US Aging involved with another ACL um, funded um, initiative, Commit to Connect, which was developed out of ACL and um, really led by ACL, focusing um, also on social isolation and loneliness and, and helping to connect people to the connections that they need to thrive. Just wanted to mention this. There's, of course, a lot more I could say about Commit to Connect, but there's a website, committoconnect.org, that has more info. Um, as well as an upcoming event um, that we'll have an engaged and commit to connect virtual summit here coming up in May. And um, you can visit the engaged website for more information on that. I, I know we just have like one minute left, so I think I will try to do one quick question. Um, so if, if you are able speakers, if you can come back on camera, if your webcam's working, you can do that. Um, I just wanted to end maybe with a, a quick round robin of advice for others on the line who are maybe with Title VI programs looking to, to build out their programming a little bit more, or maybe they're with another program that could perhaps be a, a Title VI partner. And I heard Cynthia talk about relationships and go to the publicly, you know, pu publicized events, go to the powwow, bring a chair, um, and also focus on barriers that, um, that prevent access. Maybe like transportation is a big one, but but maybe we can each end with one short <laughs> piece of advice or just final thought. Um, and if you don't have one, that's, that's fine too. But Cynthia, how about we start with you for a final thought? Uh, keep it short. I, of course I have final thoughts. <laughs> uh, I put some, um, I wrote a few con, con, or comments into the chat as well. So please pay attention. But my biggest, my biggest thing is that Title VI programs are very underfunded. Remember that every single tribal elder is a member of a tribe and the county and a state. 
so are therefore eligible for all of their services. And you heard today the, uh, the our typical Title VI directors, or maybe a little bit atypical Title VI directors, and you heard some great ideas. And yeah, we really want to meet with you. We want to talk with you. We want you to come to our house. We want to come to yours. Thank you. Sayonara. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cynthia. Joyce, Bethany, any final thoughts that you'd like to chime in with here? Um, if anybody, I put my email address in the chat. So if anybody has any information or wants information or, you know, need anything from me, um, just drop me an email. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Joyce? I'm looking forward to the conference coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. everyone there. That's great. A plug for the Title VI conference. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, we, yeah. And Cynthia, did you want to say anything on that conference? Meredith, would you let folks know, please, or can I let folks know, please? Mm -hmm. A website called it's HTTP, you know, backslash, backslash, but it ends up older Indians, all one word at acl.gov. Older Indians at acl.gov, and you've linked yourself into the Title VI. Uh, website where we post all of our information. We'd love to have you join us. We have a listserv. Thank you, Meredith. Um, we would <laughs> listserv and we just love, we do a daily blast out to our programs, a huge weekly blast. We're all about communication. We do Thursday afternoon chats. Join us and talk to all the grantees. Get a hold of me, guys. We're the show in town. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to all of the attendees who came on this webinar with us today. There will be a brief evaluation that if you have time, we really, really appreciate input. We also do a three-month touch point after webinars just to see if there's kind of any little bit longer-term impact or learnings from these webinars. So keep your eye out for those if you don't mind. There is a recording. It'll be on this website listed here, but you'll also get an email with that direct link including the PowerPoint, which has all the speakers' contact info. So if you weren't able to grab it from the chat or didn't see it, um, you can always email me, but you can, you'll can you also be finding it through the PowerPoint that we'll send out afterwards. So um, with that, we will wrap up today's webinar, and I hope everybody has a great rest of your day, great weekend, and take care, everybody.